who was a nuclear disaster more secret and longer lasting than Chernobyl. And it created the most toxic place on earth, Lake Karachi in Russia's Southern Ural Mountains, a lake so radioactive one could die just standing on its banks. It's the legacy left by the second worst nuclear accident in history. During the Cold War, the U.S. and the Soviet Union were in a race to amass atomic arsenals. But radioactivity was not well understood in those days, and few engineers knew or cared much about the dangers. Speed was the priority. Safety was secondary. The nearby town of Ozyorsk had been deliberately built upwind from Mayak to avoid contamination. But the dust cloud drifted across the entire area, including the city. That night, the cloud of radiation drifted some 200 miles to the northeast. The entire region became contaminated. Within it were businesses, roads and vehicles, industrial plants and railroads. And the Soviets kept the whole thing secret for 20 years. When the Mayak facility was built in the late 1940s, it was so secret it never appeared on any map. In the first years of its operation, it processed plutonium in six reactors situated by Lake Kiziltash. The process required a lot of water to keep the nuclear materials cool. However, eventually, the water would become contaminated, necessitating officials to find another solution for the storage of the plant's nuclear waste. The first solution was to dump much of the high-level radioactive wastewater into the nearby Tesha River. Those waters ultimately flowed into the Arctic Ocean. Worse, the river was used by dozens of villages downstream for washing, bathing, and even drinking. Mayak also used Lake Kiziltash for its open cycle nuclear cooling system, which involved draining radioactive water into the large lake. And once that became contaminated, they started using nearby Lake Karachi, a smaller, more isolated body of water. It wouldn't take long for Lake Karachi to become what was later dubbed the most polluted spot on Earth. The water is so toxic, just standing at the shoreline for less than an hour would expose one to a lethal dose of radiation. Yet, the facility was expanded in 1953 with the installation of stainless steel storage tanks for the wastewater. Rows of these containers were set in concrete foundations and buried almost 30 feet underground. Plant officials erected a small canyon of nuclear waste tanks embedded in concrete. Because the water in the tanks was still radioactive, overheating was an ongoing risk. Coolers were constructed around each row of 20 tanks. However, the technology for monitoring the condition of the coolers and the temperature of the tanks was dangerously insufficient. When the cooling system for one of the tanks broke down, nobody found out and the cooler was never repaired. As heat built up inside the tank, the storage liquid evaporated, leaving behind a dry residue of explosive ammonium nitrate. The storage facility had become a dirty nuclear bomb waiting to go off. On the afternoon of September 29th, 1957, the plant would be rocked by a massive explosion. One of the wastewater tanks containing about 80 tons of radioactive water blew apart. The detonation had the power of 70 tons of TNT. 
a slab of structural concrete weighing 160 tons, was torn off its base from the blast. A brick wall was demolished 200 yards from the explosion. A geyser of atomic smoke shot half a mile into the sky. One-tenth of the radioactive waste being stored at the plant had burst into the atmosphere in a spray of noxious dust. Deadly flickers of orange and red swirled overhead and blew downwind. Still, no casualties were officially reported immediately after the explosion. Initially, there were no warnings to nearby shops, schools, or restaurants. Instead, 22 villages, with a population totaling 10,000, were evacuated without any explanation as to why. Some places took a week to clear out, and some villagers were not moved out for nearly two years. None of them were told about the nuclear accident. Medical radiation experts took readings and noted a dramatic rise in the region's background radiation. One of the streets hardest hit by the dust cloud was where the Mayax managers lived. Officials began to restrict movements of contaminated materials. To enter the city of Ozyorsk, workers would take a car or a bus to a checkpoint, then get out and continue by foot. Their shoes were washed down before entering the town. The land area officially deemed contaminated was labeled the East Ural Radioactive Trace, and it covered over 20,000 square miles. It's home to over a quarter of a million Russians. Everything from farms and forests to villages and reservoirs were rendered unusable due to radioactive pollution. When a formal investigation was conducted of the accident, the blame was laid at the feet of the plant's director, who was immediately replaced. No word on what happened to him, but the accident was still kept secret for two decades. From the beginning, however, suspicious reports started leaking about something terrible that had happened at Mayak. Nebulous accounts of a catastrophic accident that blew radioactive fallout across the Soviet Union started to emerge in the Western press the following year, and again in 1959. During this period, the region suffered a 21% increase in cancer rates, a 25% rise in birth defects, and a 41% increase in leukemia. And still, nobody was told about the accident. Instead, the victims were diagnosed as having a mysterious disease. The disaster area was abandoned, and it lay empty and unknown for 19 years until 1976. That year, a Soviet dissident named Ahuras Medvedev exposed the full story of the catastrophe to the world press. He had no specific evidence of the event, so the rumor mill was free to add all kinds of terrifying details. Graphic reports circulated that claimed villagers were tearing the skin off of their faces and extremities, along with other horror stories. The Western nuclear industry scoffed at these accounts, not wanting to admit the potential dangers of atomic power. Still, the Soviet government covered up the full extent of the calamity until the early 1980s, when U.S. intelligence investigations questioned if the fiasco may have been the result of a weapons test malfunction. More recently, it's been revealed that the CIA was aware of the accident shortly after it happened in 1957, but kept it quiet so as not to cast a negative shadow over the growing American nuclear energy industry. It wasn't until 1989, on the eve of the Soviet Union's fall, that the Russian government finally started to declassify files about the Mayak disaster. Today, 
about half the deaths of residents along the Tesha River have been attributed to radioactive contamination. And both the Mayak plant and Lake Karachi are maintained in complete isolation. My name is Scott, and thank you so much for watching. We're a group of curious and passionate humans, creating documentary-style content for those who share our curiosity, ask questions, and seek to dig deeper in a world where almost everything isn't quite what it seems. We are Mystery Syndicate. If you like what we do, please consider subscribing to our YouTube channel, Leave a comment and give this video a like. And to be notified when we post new videos, hit that notification bell. Also, check us out on Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, TikTok. And for exclusive merchandise and our blog, visit our website at www.mysterysyndicate.com. For those that wish to support our channel, please visit Mystery Syndicate on Patreon. We have a variety of new patron tiers with tons of great benefits. If you want to see your name on a future video, be sure to check it out. From all of us at Mystery Syndicate, thank you again. We sincerely appreciate your support.